And welcome to our Bethany Church worship service. And we appreciate each one that's watching uh, by Zoom and Facebook also. Uh, we do have some announcements. Uh, this week's missions prayer is for the Global School of Sports Ministry, founded by Russ and Sue Carr. Uh, the mission of this ministry is to train sports ministry leaders in the effective use of sports as a tool for evangelism and discipleship. And we are continuing to pray for Russ and Sue Carr's daughter, Alyssa Carr Mahom, uh, who's the ministry director, but she's been suffering from an illness for some time. And uh, we are also saddened to report uh, the recent passing away of Sue Carr following a long illness. Uh, for those of you that uh, didn't have a chance to read the other announcements that were shown on the screen, uh, the sushi class was postponed and will be rescheduled, hopefully in the, in the near future. A tree sculpting class with Greg K is scheduled for June 3rd. Please RSVP to Pastor Chuck. Uh, there will be a bonsai class available on June 11th, and you can buy a starter tree for $35. Uh, there will be a treble clef choir concert on Sunday, June 12th at noon in the sanctuary following the worship service. And there are tickets available for the Dodger Angels game on Wednesday, June 15th. And there's a sign-up sheet in the patio. And there's a Father's Day luncheon scheduled for Sunday, June 19th. Uh, please uh, see the sign-up sheet if there's anything that you would like to help out with. Are there any uh, praise reports or prayer requests this morning? Okay, if not, uh, let's go to prayer. Lord, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. Thank you for being our savior, our healer, our protector, our provider, our strength. We pray for your Holy Spirit's anointing on Pastor Chuck, on our worship service and on each person participating in it, and on each person worshiping here, and watching on Facebook and Zoom. We pray for your continued anointing, provision, protection, and blessing on the Global School of Sports Ministry. Thank you for listening to and answering so many of our prayer requests for physical, emotional, and spiritual healing. We continue to pray for your healing power on Bobby Kono, Alyssa Carr Mahom, Aaron Gray, John Slagle, Linda's niece, Andrea, Sugumi's friend, Tammy L., Lloyd Henning, Barbara Fukuzawa, Lily's friend, Marlene, Jean and Maurice Chin, Marcy, Gordon's sister, Nora, Sugumi's friend, Mike, Haru Sugino, Sugumi and Hiroko for healing from cataract surgery, Comfort for the Paris and Carr families. Lord, we pray for an end to, of the war in Ukraine and that the people will turn to you in faith and hope for their future. Please bless the tithes and offerings given to you with generous, joyful, giving hearts out of love for you. Please bless each giver. And we thank you for the awesome promise that we cannot outgive what you give to us. Lord, we love you. We bless you. We thank you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, please take a minute to greet those near you while the praise team comes forward.
Oh, good morning. And one thing I wanted to recognize our college students. Uh, many of them are heading back home to their home countries. If if any of you, if this is your last Sunday with us, if you're heading heading home for the summer, could you please stand? Okay, well, we're, we're going to be praying for you, and um, let me just say, say a, a, a prayer for them right now. Okay. Lord, we thank you for these students who have joined us this year. We just pray your special blessing on them, that they would have safe travels, and would have a good summer, and that you would continue to be with them and walk with them and guide them in the future. And we look forward to seeing those that are returning in the fall. And we just ask that you would give them a blessed summer as well and continued guidance for the future. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if you would like to stand and join us for singing, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. Our theme today is the Holy Spirit. And we want to study today about how we can be filled with the Holy Spirit and unleash the power that's within us, okay? Come and worship just as you are. And I gotta adjust this a little bit. My glasses get off when I put the ear ear things in. <laughs> okay, now we're gonna focus on the Holy Spirit. This is a, a new song, I think, for us anyway. And let's focus on the Holy Spirit. Spirit. 
just overwhelms you and next is a more familiar song the spirit song by John Wimber
But Lord, we just pray that you would fill us today. You would fill this place with your spirit, Lord, that we can just walk like you and walk with you. May you be glorified in all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this morning's scriptures readings will be in it will be in two segments: John sixteen seven to eleven and Acts one eight, uh, the English Standard Version. John sixteen seven to eleven. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I tell you the truth: it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because... I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Acts 1.8 But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Lord, bless the reading of his holy uh, scripture. Thank you, Ken. And <clears throat> as I mentioned, we're talking about the Holy Spirit today. And I just pray that the, the Spirit will really guide this entire worship service and guide my message. Uh, this is something that I feel I need as, as well as everyone else. Just more learning and focus on the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's, let's pray. Lord, we, we do pray that your Spirit would guide, that your Spirit would speak through the message, through your word today and that your, your spirit would continue to work in us and through us and in the world to bring people to yourself. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> well, praying before preaching reminds me of a story about a pastor who had a five-year-old daughter, and one day she said, Dad, why do you always bow your head before you start your sermon? And, well, he was glad that she was paying attention to it, what he was doing in church and said, well, honey, I'm, I'm asking the Lord to help me to preach a good message. And she said, well, how come he doesn't answer it? And so, <clears throat> so I hope you're praying for that, too. Uh, <laughs> and today I want to talk about Holy Spirit because I think it's a neglected topic in churches and we just don't we don't teach enough about the holy spirit and really the holy spirit is uh what jesus left with us so that we could walk in power and there's two two main concerns i have is that sometimes we try to do the work of the holy spirit that only the holy spirit should be doing and then also there's power and the Holy Spirit that we're not utilizing in our lives. So I want to kind of address both of those, and that's what those two scriptures refer to that were read earlier. And first, this, the Holy Spirit, I hope you all realize, is part of the Trinity. And actually, I'll be giving a message on the Trinity uh, next month. 
and what we believe about the Trinity and what we believe is truth about the Trinity and what some mistake, mistaking, I, mistaken ideas are about the Trinity. But we definitely believe that God is one and but made up of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is seen in several scriptures. Probably the most uh, well-known is the Great Commission where Jesus told the disciples to baptize new believers in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> but also Paul also gives benediction. You know, may the love of God the Father and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And so we can see that all of these are looked at as God, the one God. But that's a future message. So today I want to focus on the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit works in the world, works in the church, and he works in us individual believers. Today I'm going to focus on the Holy Spirit's work in the world and then the Holy Spirit's work in us. But I can't cover everything. It's going to take several messages. And I will be doing another message in a couple weeks on Pentecost. And I will talk more about the gifts of the Holy Spirit at that time. And today I want to first focus on what the Holy Spirit does in the world. And that was the first scripture that was read in uh, John 16. So the first thing that is mentioned in that, John 16, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, is what it says. <clears throat> Now, most people in the world know that they are not living up to God's standard. If they lie or they cheat or they swear, steal, commit murder, they know that they've done wrong. Most, most people know that. They have a conscience. We're born with a conscience. And so John's not talking about just convicting people of normal sin so much as one main sin that he talks about the most dangerous sin is what he talks about now if you went out on the street and asked people what's the most dangerous sin one that you know maybe god just wouldn't forgive stealing lying adultery murder uh, or not believing in jesus now, most people on the street would not say, well, not believing in Jesus is the most dangerous and worst sin in the world. But that's really what this passage is saying, that the Holy Spirit is coming to convict people of not believing. See, in verse 9, it says, concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. And that's really the most difficult sin to convince people of. Um, when we're, when we're sharing with people, I meant when we were in Japan, the most difficult thing to convince people of was that Jesus really was God and that Jesus rose from the dead. And the Holy Spirit has to do the work. We just cannot argue people into the kingdom. And this word uh, that's translated convict can also be translated reprove or reveal, bring to light, expose. And so that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in the world, is exposing and revealing and uh, bringing light to people that Jesus really is who he said he was, that he is God, and that to not believe in him is the most dangerous sin that we can commit. And then the second thing he says is the Holy Spirit convicts the world of righteousness, and, and then in verse 10, he gives a little more detail of what he means. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. <clears throat> now, what did Jesus mean by that? Well, I think that convicting the sin of the world of the sin of righteousness means they realize Jesus was righteous. Jesus was who he said he was. He said that he would die for the sins of the world. He said that he would be raised. He said he could lay down his life when he wanted. He said he could pick up his life 
when he wanted to. And he was vindicated by the resurrection. And so the Holy Spirit convicts people that um, Jesus is the Lord and also that Jesus was righteous and only Jesus was righteous and that we are not righteous. And then the third thing he convicts the world of is judgment. And he gives, he gives more detail in verse 10 concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And he's talking about the ruler of this world, the Satan. And when Jesus said it at that time, Satan has been judged and he's been judged guilty. And the sentence will be carried out actually in the future. But Jesus' death and resurrection was proof that the judgment has been made and Satan is judged guilty and that we can escape judgment by putting our faith in the Lord. So that conviction of judgment, it's really people realize, well, if Jesus had to go through that, then there really is going to be a judgment. If God is that serious about sin that he would have to sacrifice his own son to suffer on the cross, then judgment must be real. We're all going to stand before the Lord someday. And so that's the, that's the other thing that the Holy Spirit convicts people of, that there is a judgment coming. So the sin of not believing in Jesus, the sin that Jesus was who he said he was, that he was the only righteous one, and convicting the world of judgment to come. And I just don't think that we can argue, shame, or force people to repent and believe of these things. We need the Holy Spirit to be working in the hearts of people that we are talking to. <clears throat> Something that illustrated this to me, I read recently about a professor at Talbot. Talbot's a part of Biola uh, University. Talbot's the seminary. And this professor was studying about the uh, pro-abortion uh, movement, and he wanted to come up with understanding of what, what they're teaching and thinking and, and think of ways to counter their teaching and to dialogue with people who are so strongly believing uh, that abortion should be allowed in all circumstances. And so there was this seminar for pro-abortion uh, people in L.A. And so he went to the seminar so he could hear what they're teaching and that he could develop arguments and have some non-confrontational dialogue with people in this seminar. So he went in and he was able to accomplish the goals uh, and he learned a lot about how these people were thinking. He was able to interact with a few people during the breaks. And he was coming out, and he was accosted by these people, pro-life Christians, carrying banners, and they started yelling at him that he was a child killer and a murderer. And he said, oh, wait, wait, I'm, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. What? You're a Christian. Well, what are you doing in there? You're a compromised Christian. You're not a real Christian if you went in there. He says, no, no, I went in so I could dialogue with these people so I could talk to them. They said, you can't be a real Christian if you went into that place. And his point was that um, we can't be the Holy Spirit. We can't yell at people and call them names and expect them to go, oh, well, I want to follow your Jesus. <laughs> it's just not, not going to work. The Holy Spirit has to convict them. What we're called to do is to pray for these people, to love them, do good works for them, and share testimony, share scripture with them, and try to dialogue with them in a non-confrontational way like this uh, Talbot professor was doing. So he was quite quite discouraged by the the treatment that he got from some of these people. Not, not all of the people 
Not all the protesters were like that, but there were several who really attacked him and just would not listen to his reasoning. And so, again, the work of the Holy Spirit amongst the unbelievers in the world is to convince them that Jesus is who he said he was, that he was righteous, and telling the truth about himself and that the judgment is to come. And so I want to briefly look at what the Holy Spirit does in believers in us. And because we have this power of the Holy Spirit in us, and Jesus, when Jesus was on earth, Jesus could only work wherever he was physically located. And when he left, he said, when I leave, then the Holy Spirit will come and be with all believers, no matter where you are, the Holy Spirit will be with you. And since God is one, the Holy Spirit's with you, Jesus is with you, the Father's with you, and the power of God is with you. And there are many things talked about in the scriptures about what the Holy Spirit does. And I'm just going to run through them quickly. And these are on the insert in your bulletin. And I won't look at all the, the Bible verses. That's, that's your homework if you want to uh, look up these Bible verses. But I think you know most of these, but the Holy Spirit regenerates us. The first thing he does in us, he regenerates our hearts and gives us a heart desiring to know more about the Lord and a heart to want to follow the Lord. And then he indwells us. So he promises to always be with us no matter what we might be going through. And he baptizes us into his kingdom. So when the Holy Spirit comes in, that's uh, our initial baptism into the kingdom of God. And we're sealed, as it says in Ephesians. And the seal just means that you are now protected by the Holy Spirit and, and you have that stamp of confirmation that you are part of God's uh, family. So he's not going to let you go. And Jesus said, you know, those that are in my hand are in the Father's hands, and no one can take them out of my hand. You are, you are sealed with, with the Lord by the Holy Spirit. And then... It says that the Holy Spirit comforts us in times of trouble. And in John 14, Jesus talks about, I will send the comforter to you. Now, comfort from the Holy Spirit is he comforts us with God's promises, with God's word, and reminds us of the things that God has done for us and encourages us. It's another another way that it can be translated. He's comforting and encouraging and helps us, strengthens us in our weakness. We've studied about that recently in Romans 8. And he gives, gives us joy. And that's in Romans 14, which we haven't gotten to yet. But the real source of our joy is God's Holy Spirit. No matter what our circumstances are, we can still have that inner joy. I always remember what one pastor said, that <clears throat> happiness depends on happening, happenings. So we have to have good happenings to be happy. But joy comes from within, from the Holy Spirit, from believing God's promises and remembering those. And so we can have joy even when things are not going well at all. And you may have had some days like that. Uh, and uh, I've had a few myself. Uh, and um, I won't let Jan tell you about when I don't always display the joy of the Spirit. You know, be a long list. But, but when we remember that we have that, that well spring of life in us, the Holy Spirit, uh, we can, we can um, recall the promises of the Lord and ask the Lord to bring that joy back no matter what our circumstances. And he gives us discernment and wisdom. And he does that not only individuals, but for the church. 
he gives the church wisdom about choosing <clears throat> leaders and missionaries and making decisions for the church. And he gives each of us discernment about what is right and wrong, what is, what is from, coming from God and what's coming from the evil one. And so there's so many things that the Holy Spirit does for us and we're just not always uh, taking advantage of the things that the Holy Spirit has promised to do. And then in Acts 1.8, as it says, the Holy Spirit will, the power will come upon you when the Holy Spirit comes. And Jesus said that just before he was ascended into heaven. And <clears throat> that was 40 days after the resurrection that Jesus shared that with the disciples. And then he was raised to heaven and at that point, uh, the people prayed for 10 days before Pentecost. Now, and Pentecost is now about two weeks away, 14 days away. So it would be a great thing for us to do to just be in serious prayer for the next two weeks before Pentecost and really pray that God would pour out his spirit and give us boldness like he did to the disciples on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus also promised that the Holy Spirit would give us words to say when we're being attacked or persecuted because of our faith or we're being mocked. Um, the Holy Spirit gives us words to counter what people, persecutors, are saying to us. And so he said, we don't, you don't have to worry about what to say in the day that you're being attacked because... I will give you the words. The Holy Spirit will give you the words. And then, of course, spiritual fruit is another whole message, but the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us that spiritual fruit and um, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, uh, self-control, gentleness. And the Holy Spirit gives that to us as we submit ourselves uh, willingly to the Holy Spirit. And then spiritual gifts, again, I'll be talking about that in a couple of weeks. And the Holy Spirit also gives power for praying for people to be healed and for God to do miraculous works. And that's a little bit what I want to... Uh, get into today, God's power, and also we'll talk more about that on Pentecost as well. <clears throat> but when Jesus said that that power would come upon them, on Pentecost, you remember the first thing, there were flames above the apostles' heads, and then they spoke in languages that they didn't know, but there are people in the crowds that knew those languages, and they heard God being praised in their own home language. And then they became bold. Before that, they'd been hiding and, you know, behind locked doors, and they weren't letting anybody know where they were. They certainly weren't out preaching about Jesus. They were in hiding, basically. But when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they became bold. And Peter gave a great sermon that day, and thousands came to the Lord in faith because of that boldness that the Holy Spirit had given them. And that is the main, one of the main points that I want to get across is that it's the Holy Spirit that gives us that boldness and confidence to share with people. And so what we want to do, uh, sorry, um, on here is first that pray that the Lord would fill us with his spirit and that we'd become bold in our witness and that God would give us open doors and opportunities to share with people and that people uh, that we meet would be convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment. That's the work of the Holy Spirit and that's how we partner with the Holy Spirit. And... I would ask for your prayers for this evening. I'm 
it's been over two years since I've been into the jail because of uh, COVID, but I've got an opportunity to go in tonight. And in my own strength, I always feel like I'm totally not adequate for this work. I uh, never know what you're going to get into when you go into the jail. You go in and there may be a whole group that's just anxious to, to uh, have a time of worship, or they may just all be watching TV and some sporting event, and you just never know what kind of response you're going to get <clears throat> when you go in, and you never know what kind of questions you're going to get. And so as, as much as I can prepare, it may go a totally different way, and I have to totally rely on the Holy Spirit. And I usually have lots of... Uh, anxiety before going in and I just have to keep praying that God will fill me with his spirit and take away the anxiety and just help me to love these guys and so I'd appreciate your prayer for that and I will be praying for each of you this coming week that you will be filled and then when you have opportunities it can be it may be a small opportunity it may be a big opportunity um, something that we talked with the uh, I talked with the elders about I had watched a seminar a webinar uh, a few weeks ago and it talked about this ministry of prayer praying for people and then inviting them to church <clears throat> as a way of building a church and so they recommended running ads on Facebook and then boosting those ads to go out to more people and then saying, offering to pray for people and then when people ask for prayer, then pray for them and invite them to church. So we ran an ad in Facebook and we've had about five people respond asking for prayer and we have uh, prayed and I've sent them personal messages and, and of prayer and uh, two people have said they want to come. Uh, one person asked me how to donate to the church. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, the Holy Spirit can work through even Facebook, right? Um, I know some, some Christians think you shouldn't, shouldn't even be on Facebook. But so many people are on Facebook, and when we send these out, there are people that are looking for prayer. And it got me thinking about, you know, just in everyday life, all of us, when you're out and about, <clears throat> if you're dealing with someone in a store, or if you're at the doctor, the dentist, and you're talking to people, it's easy just to ask them, is there anything you need prayer for? You know, I like to pray for people. And is anything you like prayer for? And... A lot, a lot of people will say, well, I appreciate that. You know, I, I don't have anything right now. Or they'll say, well, yeah, you know, if you could pray for my mom or my sister, or if you could pray that I could find a better place to live, or um, people appreciate that and then pray for them and invite them to come to church. And it's, it's a work of the Holy Spirit to just be filled enough to be bold enough to ask people if you can pray for them. So that's just one, one way you can apply this. <clears throat> and we are to be witnesses, uh, bold in our witness, and pray for those open doors and opportunities, and that God will convict them. Now, when, when we make use of a testimony, see the uh, disciples shared testimony of what they had seen Jesus do. And we can do the same thing. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be your salvation testimony. It could be just any, any testimony, anything that you've seen God do in your life or someone else's life that you can just share a short testimony and maybe share a Bible verse. That's when the Holy Spirit works. And it's a, it's a partnership. See, <clears throat> we get filled, we get bold, then we share... And then when people hear the word and hear the testimony, then the Holy Spirit works in their hearts. And then, then they respond and they ask for more information. 
I thought about a story that I heard back when we were in Japan, and it was really a precious testimony at this uh, conference. And this man shared that when he was a teenager, he was a bit of a rascal. And I know all about being a rascal as a teenager. And he, he did not know the Lord, but he had a crush on this girl. And he would ask this girl to go to the movies with him. And she said, no way. And, well, how about just going for an ice cream? No, no. And, well, how about if we just take a walk around the block? And she would say, no. Well, this girl was a serious Christian. And he would keep asking her, and she said, no. Finally, one day, she said, well, if you want to come and uh, sit on the front porch and talk for a while, then I'll take a walk with you. And so, he, well, I'll come up and sit on the porch. They sat in two separate chairs on the porch. And first thing she did was uh, get two Bibles and gave him a Bible. Then she had a Bible. And she did a familiar way of sharing that I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with. But she said, well, just open your Bible to Romans chapter 3 and read verse 10. It says, none is righteous, no, not one. And read chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he read those and she said, well, do you think that includes you and me? He goes, yeah, I guess, I guess it would include you and me. And then she said, well, why don't you read, uh, go over a couple chapters. Chapter 5, verse 8. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Oh, sorry, that's verse 6. And then verse 8, but God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. She said, well, do you think Jesus died for you? Well, yeah, I guess he did. Well, that means that Jesus loves you then, right? Well, I guess it does. And he was starting to get a little bit quivering in his voice. And uh, she said, well, why don't you read uh, the last verse in chapter 6? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. She said, would, would you like to have eternal life? Would you like to have assurance that you'll live forever in heaven? And by this time, his eyes were getting a little watery, and he said, yeah, I guess, I guess I would. And so she read him Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that Christ raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. And so he prayed that day and received the Lord, and he ended up marrying that girl, and he ended up becoming a pastor and a theologian and wrote books, and he was a speaker at the Deeper Life Conference in Japan. She didn't, she didn't, you know, badger him with, you know, you're, you're just a rascal sinner. I'd, I'd never spend a day with you. She just let the Holy Spirit work through the reading of the word. And that's all we have to do. All we have to do is share testimony, share a verse, let the Holy Spirit do the work of softening their hearts and opening it up. So again... Uh, be witnesses and make use of that sword of the spirit which is the word of God and there is one thing that I this isn't on the insert um, my message kind of changed as the week went along but there are there are reasons that we may not be seeing the spirit working and one of those is, of course, we may not be praying for God to fill us with the Spirit. So we, we definitely need to be praying. 
when we're not praying for the Spirit to fill us, it's kind of like starting out on the desert, uh, crossing a desert, and you've got uh, a couple of canteens of water, and you, well, I can make it, but eventually you run out of water, and if you don't know where the, the springs are, you're going to be in trouble. And we often kind of start out in our own power, and things are going okay, but then we hit obstacles, we hit challenges, we hit uh, stressful times, problems, and if we're not asking the Lord to fill us and recharge us, then we're not going to be able to uh, experience the power of the Holy Spirit. And we might be resisting the Spirit. This is mentioned in Acts 7, 51. This is where Paul is telling some of the Jewish leaders, why do you keep resisting the Holy Spirit? And when the Spirit is obviously nudging you to believe, or sometimes the Spirit might be saying to us, oh, you need to talk to that person, or you need to forgive that person, or you need to quit doing this, or quit going there. If we're not, if we're not listening to the Holy Spirit, we're resisting the Holy Spirit, then we're not going to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. And we might grieve the Holy Spirit, which is mentioned in Ephesians 4. This if we have bitterness or anger, slander, unforgiveness in our heart, then the Holy Spirit is grieved. I don't know about you, but when, you're, when I'm grieving, I just don't feel like doing a lot of work. I don't feel like going out and sharing the gospel for certain when I'm, when I'm really grieving over something. And the Holy Spirit's the same way. If the Holy Spirit's grieved by our lifestyle, then he's just not going to be working through us. And we may have quenched the Spirit. And quenching the Spirit is, is talked about in 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, don't despise prophetic utterances. Don't, and I think you can expand that. Don't, don't despise obvious works of the Spirit. When God is working and answering somebody's prayers or God is speaking through someone, yeah, well, yeah, that, that's not for me. I, I don't know if that's really God or not, you know. Now, the next verse, he does say, examine everything carefully and hold fast to what is good. So we are supposed to examine things and make sure that it's from the Lord and the Holy Spirit. But when, when it's pretty obvious that it is, this person is somebody who walks with God and they've, they are praying or they're getting a word from the Lord, then we should not despise that or we're quenching the work of the Holy Spirit. It's kind of like putting water in your gas tank in your car. <clears throat> and we need, we need gasoline in our car. If we, if we try to run the car without gasoline, you get a bunch of people to push the car and, and you're going down a downhill slope and hey, we're doing okay on our own power. When you hit an uphill slope, if you don't have gasoline, you're not gonna get far. And if you put water in the gas, you're really going to be in trouble. And that's the same way it is when we uh, grieve or quench the Holy Spirit. So just to summarize, I think I have a summary on here. <clears throat> we need to pray for a filling of the Spirit and pray that we can boldly testify and boldly declare God's Word and that the Holy Spirit will work in the hearts of those that we are sharing with, that will give us those opportunities to uh, share with people and let the Holy Spirit work as we share a testimony or a word. And we need to periodically examine ourselves to make sure we're not quenching the Spirit, grieving the Spirit, or resisting the Spirit. And I think if we do that, we're going to experience a lot more power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and I want to see power unleashed in each person here, including myself, so let's, let's pray for that right now. Lord, we just pray that you would unleash your power in us, that you would speak to us if we are, if we are quenching or grieving your Spirit or resisting your Spirit, Lord, please make that clear and just help us to get right with you, and Lord, I pray that you give each one here opportunities and open doors 
people whose hearts are open and ready to receive a word of testimony or a verse, and that you would use that to draw them to yourself. And please convict them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Lord, thank you for your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Um, I think it's time for the praise team to come up. Breathe on me, breath of God, from the hymn book. for doxology we will sing spirit of the living god okay. one time through God the Father, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow, this week, forevermore. And may you be filled with the Spirit this week. Be bold in your witness and see the Lord convict hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join us in the courtyard for fellowship time. <laughs> 